Welcome back to Norsley TV. Yes, here we are after a couple of weeks. We missed last week due to Shavuot, but that was quite the Shavuot. Here we were thinking that people weren't going to come back for all night learning. And then I, I think probably the biggest highlight for me was seeing all of the youth. Yes, it was absolutely amazing. The, it was like, Joey was like, where did all these kids come from? <laughs> it was really, it was really wonderful to see them um, have their own little TED Talks and um, and then they joined us for the barbecue, which was really nice in the, in the marquee. And it wasn't too too cold uh, and we heard um, from great speakers, so it was really wonderful. And uh, we continued um, with cheesecake getaway, little takeaways, right? So little kiddish to go for the first time back. So that was really nice. People are able to eat it in the marquee as well. And now that um, we had our first Sunday after, you know, being allowed to have 30 people in a garden. We had a lot of simplas over the weekend. You know, double benot mitzvahs on Shabbos. Mazatops to the Olivia and Emily Gordon. We had three baby namings this past Shabbos. <laughs> it was one unplanned. <laughs> one unplanned baby naming. Yeah, it was really, really full of simcha. Baruch Hashem. And on Sunday, we had the Sarah Singers bat mitzvah. And we celebrated with the Gutten Tags in their marquee for the bar mitzvah, and we had a couple of weddings. A mal stuff to Tamar Neville, who was, who got married yesterday. She was uh, one of the bat mitzvah team members who did the bat mitzvah program last year during COVID. So, or it was actually two years ago already. Yeah, but um, yeah, quite uh, quite a, a weekend it's been. But it's good that we're having simchas because it's been a tough time for our people between our brothers and sisters under fire from Hamas in Israel and then spilling over to the streets of London here and really around the world. But I have to tell you, even our brothers and sisters suffering in Israel, the amount of support that we give from here in the UK is really significant. Uh, today, we visited the Sarah Ronson Crisis and Inf Intervention Center in Sterat. And of course, we know that Sterat is a border town with Gaza. That I, uh, my, I, I take my hat off to these people in the Gaza border towns. You, 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 if, how many of us would just move? You know, there's only so much that a person can take. And you say, well, you know, what do I need it for? And yet these people... They keep their families at the front lines and they say, well, if we don't live here, then it will just be... Absolutely. And, and you'll hear from uh, Director of Amuna where she talks about how a lot of these caseworkers come and live in Sterot, you know, with their families to take care of people um, going through the trauma. So let's go over to, to Deborah and Sharon DeWinter. Welcome, Deborah, Nathan and Sharon DeWinter to Norris Lee TV. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, so sh let me just introduce Sharon. Sharon DeWinter is uh, British uh, UK, the director of British Emuna. And we have uh, Deborah Nathan with director of uh, World Emuna. I know we have a, a, a very close connection with Emuna, the, the Norris Lee. Uh, we have the Sarah Ronson Crisis and Intervention Center there in, right there in Sterot. Uh, and we know that it, they've been doing amazing work, especially now during the situation in Israel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on, the situation on the ground? I will. So thank you very much for inviting us to be here. Um, I am here really to speak on behalf of all of the frontline Emona staff who are working with vulnerable children and families across Israel in many, many centers, but particularly at the moment down in the south of Israel. Um, and across large areas of the south of Israel where, where they've been under really near constant barrage um, of rocket attacks from Gaza. Um, the rocket attacks you will have heard have also reached up and, and included Jerusalem and into Tel Aviv, which is very unusual um, and actually has its own impact um, as well on, on the populations because it's so unusual. Um, unfortunately, our, the populations of the communities in the south are well uh, used to uh, being in this situation, um, but it doesn't in any way diminish the trauma and the effects there. It's just, it has become their kind of normal life. Um, so we've seen this, uh, you know, the barrage of rockets that came from Gaza and what we've uh, experienced is really an, a big increase in numbers of people 
attending MNR centres. Now, MNR is one of the biggest providers of social welfare services across Israel. Um, and we have a number of different kinds of services. So you might know us for our residential children's homes. Um, we have high schools. We have, we're very well known in Israel for our daycare, including multi-purpose daycare, where at-risk and um, very young at-risk at children are helped um, and looked after and the families are supported. And really we help those children not have to be taken into care. Um, and we also have counselling and crisis centres um, around the country. The, the social unrest um, that we're feeling here is actually, to many people, as, as concerning as the rockets, um, which is in, not in any way to, to um, underplay the effect of the, the rocket attacks, because really it is unbearable for those that are living under the barrage. They have had night after night of no sleep. They have had, they've got very, very frightened children. We've got, um, we're hearing um, cases of teenagers who are wetting the bed. I mean, really children who, who are regressing to the point where their behavior is like little children, clinging to their parents, unable to go out. Um, we had an example this week, a, a, um, one of our graduates from one of our children's homes lives in the Israeli city of Ramleh. With, and she was in her apartment with some others um, when the riots were going on outside and her balcony of her apartment was actually firebombed. Um, and she was inside the apartment. She was terrified for her life. Um, and this girl is, is a graduate. She doesn't have um, an easy family background. She doesn't have a very supportive uh, family who can help her. So Emma is who she turns to and we were able to give her immediate financial and psychological support, um, which is ongoing because she's part of a program where we look after the graduates who have moved on from our home. Are you finding that the situation now is a lot worse than in the past? I mean, it's not the first time specifically the South and Sterod have, have received rockets. I think the trouble is that um, it, it's to some extent the trauma is cumulative. Um, if I can give you another example, we had uh, a little girl who was nine years old who was coming in for therapy. Um, actually, her mother and her aunt are also both coming in for and receiving counselling as well. Um, they've um, were they've grown up and they live in Sterot, this this family, um, and when the, the mother and her sister were nine years old themselves, their home was destroyed by a rocket. So this new incident is triggering all sorts of emotions in them to see their children frightened, to see, you know, the extent that that, that, that they are going through this now, and to know that it's the, their second generation trauma uh, victims, and it really is the case that we don't know the damage that's done. You can't see the damage, the psychological damage that, that's happening. Um, and really, you know, in a way, it's very sad that they're used to living like this and that, that the communities in the South really experience and live with a level of stress and trauma that is, is not healthy and is not um, normal. Um, so we're seeing the, sort of the, the effects there on the family. You, you have emotional stress and problems with, with um, family breakdown exacerbated by the stress of the situation. We talk about the effect, the long-term effects and what happens the day after. So the day after the rockets stop, what happens? The children eventually will go back to schools. I mean, the schools are closed because you can't get a class of children into safety in 15 seconds, which is all they have in Sterot. So eventually those children have to go to school. First of all, they have to leave their parents, they have to leave the safe room, they have to leave their homes. Just being in the street is frightening for these children. Um, they know that a, a six-year-old child was killed, you know, within Sterot, in his safe room. And if you think what that does to the child, because your safe room is supposed to be safe. That's right. And actually they know, and, and children, very young children, and it could be their school friends of this boy, it can be, you know, somebody who lives in your neighbourhood. They know he, he went into the into the safe room and it wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with those. Those problems come out. Those problems come out when it's when there's a quiet. We also don't know how long quiet is ever going to last. And, and the saddest one of the saddest aspects of this last week and, and week and a half was that we were just coming out of Corona and the country was just really breathing a sigh of relief. This communities in the South had a quiet year last year. You do get a semblance of normality and people I think it's in human nature to forget in a way and to, to allow yourself to breathe and just sort of enjoy yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that in our daycare centers in, in the South, one of them told me for Shavuot, they had arranged to have a rabbi come with a Sefer Torah because the parents are still not allowed into our daycare settings. They have to drop the children off at the door 
they can't come in, but they were going to have a party outside. And of course, that was all immediately cancelled and, and, and that went. And so there's a feeling also of, of loss from what they, they felt that like they were coming out. Um, right. and we, we'll pick up the pieces, you know, that the, the, the um, we have contacts with all of the schools, the local communities. Um, the doctors and they will refer people to us. Right, recently you, you just expanded the Sarah Ronson Centre, right? Uh, just in yes, okay. yes, just, I mean, it, it hasn't been officially opened yet and we're looking forward to visitors coming from the UK very, very much to um, have an official dedication and opening because without the generosity of our donors in the UK and, and, and other countries then we would not have had, a, had the centre the chance to expand it because the centre we had was absolutely um, that the demand was so great that it was operating from eight in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. It was every single bit of space was used. We've now got, I think it's almost three times the space that we had, many more therapy rooms, many more um, opportunities to give the community help. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful new building. Um, and it's all are, thanks, it's a lot of thanks go to your community, I have to say. Um, that has enabled that to happen, which we're really grateful for because we can see every day, especially now, how much work is needed and we've got the therapists and we've got the rooms that we be able to see so many more people. Having said that, the flip side of it is there's so many more people that we need to see with an extra 30 to 40 people phoning our 24-7 hotline needing help from us that we actually need to employ more therapists um, and counsellors to be able to fill that demand. It's just non-stop. And again, the 24-7 hotline is also funded by British MONA to be able to help those people when they're so desperate at three o'clock in the morning, they don't know what to do and there's somebody there to help them. There's never a no at the end of the phone. Wow. So, so this hotline is part of the Sarah Ronson Crisis Intervention Centre? It Correct. Right. So, and, well, and it's something it's something that British MR, you know, thought was important a long time ago and, and really has has been supporting for a long time. And it's particularly important because a lot of people are too frightened to leave their homes. So yeah. to have a telephone link is a real lifeline. So our staff also live in the south and they're also affected by the rockets. And they often, you know, they have children who aren't in school and and, and they have families themselves. Many of them will travel and, and put themselves at, at risk to come into the centre. And the centre does have um, a very uh, uh, an adequate, in fact, has two safe rooms so that there is room for anybody to get there. Um, but if those therapists can't come in, they're on the phone and they will be dealing with clients all the time, at reaching out. Our centre in Netivot, which is also supported by British Emelna, is uh, our counselling centre there, doesn't have a safe room and has to close by government order when the situation is as it has been. Now, they're carrying on giving therapy, but we desperately, desperately need a safe room for that facility so that the patients can, can be seen and can continue to come in because Zoom is wonderful and it's wonderful that we can speak, but actually for therapists and counselling, um, you know, it's important to be face to face. And especially like in the safe room, right? I mean, the, we, when you have the young children, what are they meant to do? How are they, how are they parents? I think Sharon, you were saying how some of the uh, therapists were, were dealing, advising, what exactly? So Deborah was telling me earlier on in the week, I mean, I've always said the staff, therapists, counsellors and Amona go above and beyond anything that they are paid to do. So these therapists and counsellors, teachers in daycare centres will be shielding in their own safe rooms, looking after their own families, making sure that they are calm and they'll be on the phone at the same time to the parents of the daycare centre children or a client from one of the therapy centres and they'll be telling them how to keep their own children, their children calm at the same time, giving them games to play, giving them tools to keep their children calm and collected during this horrible time. They can be cooped up in these shelters in and out all day, every day, as we've seen over the last week and a half. Mm -hmm. And so our therapists are not only looking after their own children, they're looking after everybody, whoever phones them whenever they can. As I said, the phone is a lifeline to these people and it's 24 seven. It's really important that people know the effects on Israeli children and families. And because there's a lot of media coverage at the moment about the effect of, on, on, on the children and families in Gaza. And I understand the, the, the UK media particularly, it's full of, of images, you're seeing suffering, mm. but a lot of the suffering, you know, there is suffering in Israel too. It is not initiated in any way, the situation by Israel. Um, if, if the Hamas rockets stop tomorrow, 
nothing would, you know, that nothing would come from Israel. And it's really important that the trauma that we're seeing and, and that is really manifesting every single day across Israel, really across Israel, and not even, not just in the South. You know, there are children in our home in B'nai Brak. It's a home in the center of Israel. And they've not experienced this before. These are children who can't live with their parents because of, of abuse and, uh, and harm and neglect at home. And they come to us and we're a safe haven. And now they have been you know, taken from their beds in the middle of the night because of rockets that have come over central Israel. You know, we are one family. We are one, you know, people. We are hurting because of the anti-Semitism we're seeing in the world. And we are, you know, we, are, we know that you are worrying about us as well. But please make sure that you just, you know, that, that just to redress a tiny bit of the balance that, you know, that people understand that, you know, Israel is not this tough, well, we're not a tough aggressor country. We are, you know, we are care, we care about our people, we protect our people. Mm. Services like Emona are there to help our people heal and to be, to be well through this, this, this uh, extreme situation and beyond. And the effects will go on for years. MNR will be there as long as people need us. We are there to help in the long term. It's not just an emergency. And when the rockets stop, MNR will be getting down to, to work and helping people rebuild their lives and, and, and cope and continue to prosper and to succeed. Um, so, you know, just please get that word out there for Israel. It's, it's really important. Absolutely. I yeah. guess for everybody in the UK, it's really to keep updated through social media, the British MNR social media sites. Um, if you'd like more detailed updates, then please get in touch. We can put you on our mailing list, which I'm sending out the updates that I get from Deborah on a regular basis. Um, and just to put it into clarity, really how MNR helps, the annual budget of, well, of Israel MNR over a year is 800 million shekel, which is about 178 million pounds. The government and all the local councils actually only fund 90% of that. And if you think of that, that's a lot of money still for the rest of the world to find and to fund. I have to clarify, that is on a regular basis without any emergency situation whatsoever. We're still catching up from COVID last year where the extra hours, the extra therapy, the extra food that needed to be dealt with the children that were living in the homes and the extra staff that had to come in, we're still playing catch up on that emergency. And now this emergency has come in and now we're gonna be playing catch up for even longer. Mm. Um, whatever any of our supporters can do, whatever of you, any of your community can do to help the situation is so appreciated. Um, I know there is a naming opportunity, Deborah mentioned our, our centre in Niti Vot, where there isn't a safe room, there is a naming opportunity there if somebody would like to do something in memory of somebody and build that safe room so we can get more therapists seeing these clients, as many as possible, and they can open up their centre again during these situations, please be in touch at British MNR, we have a website mnr.org.uk um, and you know we'll be really happy to speak to you if somebody wants to speak to us in more detail then with pleasure we are around and Deborah's also around at the end of the phone she's been in my I've taken over Deborah's position before she made when she made Aliyah so we both really know how Britain works and how MNR supporters in the UK and especially in the suburbs really really do help. I'd just like to extend an invitation because please God we will soon have visitors again to Israel and you are very welcome to come to any MNR centers for us to, to, we will look after you, we'll welcome you and really we're looking forward to having everybody back here. Please yeah, go mm -hmm. safely and soon. I know. You say seeing is believing and really that's how it got me involved in the first place because I went and I saw and it just pulls at you and you never want to let it go <laughs> at the end of the day. Well, Yashikov, to all the amazing work that you're doing uh, for the people of Israel and for the children specifically, uh, we know you do a, a wonderful work. Yashikov, thank you very much for joining me, and uh, we look forward to sharing happy occasions together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, really amazing work that Amuna does. You know, we know that our, like they mentioned, a lot of our own very own members, Rochelle Selby and uh, Hillary and Mayor Porman although now they made Aliyah, are uh, very much involved with Emunah and other members here uh, doing great work for the people of Israel. Yeah, but like I mentioned, I mean, this, these are 
really tough times for our people to see Jews being beaten up in the streets of London, Rabbi, Germany, New York. But there are beacons of light throughout our community. Uh, I spoke today with Lord Winston, and he's very proud of Imperial being a place that one can proudly be Jewish. And I spoke to Lord Winston about his appearance this week at the Hay Festival. Let's see what Lord Winston had to say. Shalom, Lord Winston. Thank you so much for joining us on Norris Lee TV. Right. It's wonderful to have you here and uh, wonderful to have you as such an esteemed member of our Hampstead Garden suburb community. Uh, and today we're going to talk about your appearance later this week at the Hay Festival. Yes, well, um, I've done a pre-recorded uh, interview with uh, with them some time ago, actually. I don't remember what I said now, so it's rather tricky. And I, it basically, I've been, I, I mean, I've been having a fairly regular slot at the Hay Festival for quite a long time, most mostly in connection with, of course, the books I write. Um, the, the, the two books which I'm 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 peddling this 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 uh, this this time at the Hay Festival are books which were published during the pandemic um, for young children. So basically, uh, these are part of a series of books uh, which I've done for Dorling Kindersley um, on science for. Uh, children under the age of 11, really. So one, one book is called uh, Ask a Scientist, which is basically um, taking a 100 of the most uh, common questions I get asked by primary schools from all over the United Kingdom, uh, and also on web. Basically, it was started by my grandchildren asking questions. And then from that, we started to look at what I was doing in primary schools, because I go quite regularly and, uh, and do a lot of primary school start outreach. And then, in fact, we then Dorling Kinsley put it on the web, and we got questions from as far away as, as South Korea and Argentina. So these are global questions, but they're always the same questions, which is wonderful. So I, I've sort of answered, you know, these questions, which um, in best I best I can. Sometimes it's a bit of a challenge. Um, as I get older, I forget more and more science. The other, <laughs> uh, the, the other, the other book I've, I've, I'm also um, uh, promoting on, on, on at Hay is a book on on inventors, uh, which um, includes a number of people who have really changed the world with their inventions. So it's it's focusing on the inventors, not so much as on the inventions. I see. Would you say, I mean, your, the way that you write your books and uh, cater to children, I think is, is almost unparalleled amongst scientists of your caliber. Uh, you know, many of them living in the ivory tower or living in the laboratory, and yet you've taken it upon yourself, Lord Winston, to visit those primary schools to write these books. Would you say that their that your Jewish values have inspired you to to take it from one level to the next? Well, that's a very very big jump. I mean, I think first of all, it's fair to say that there are a large number of scientists who are doing what I'm doing, but don't get quite so much coverage. And I think. For example, I was sitting next to the uh, the head of mathematics at Imperial College last week, and he suddenly told me, well, I, I've been busy this morning because I've been teaching at this primary school in East London, uh, not actually far from Stamford Hill. And we talked about the Jewish community there. Uh, he's non-Jewish, and he's all a bit puzzled by them. And, and I said, I said, well, you know, uh, they, they are a bit different. You know, They're not, they don't really represent the sort of Orthodox Judaism that you know, a lot of, um, you know, my, 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 my family belong to. Uh, but what was interesting was that he goes regularly every week to teach in this primary school with a different group of children because he feels that math is a different kind of way. And he's brilliant, he's wonderful, totally self-effacing. And I think, there are, I think there are a lot of scientists who probably ought to deserve much more credit. And I think that has changed. I mean, when I first started doing public engagement work back in the 70s, I have to admit that my my colleagues were pretty snarly about it. They they thought, I think they thought I was on a sort of personality cult. But it's my view that it is really important, and I, I, because I think we do need to show that science is part of humanity. And in that sense, of course, there is a Jewish connection, because um, I mean, so much of the stuff I've done, certainly in biological sciences, has been very much influenced by my by my orthodox background. So. 
um, you know, the, 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 issue, the issues of, of um, the requirements for life um, and, and health and so on are things which, of course, come out again and again. And, of course, I've been lucky because, of course, the, way, the area I've been working in has been human reproduction. And the most extraordinary thing that people find very surprising because they don't know the Torah is, is that actually, you know, three of the four matriarchs were infertile. They, they find that really odd. Um, and I point out that there is an amazing, uh, there's an amazing number of stories, really, which keep on recurring about the pain that fertility causes, uh, infertility causes. And, and um, it's very, very central to the thinking and ethics of Judaism. Of course, the books I'm writing for Dorling Kindersley are not really to do with fertility because on the whole, for children of seven or eight, we don't really get round to that very much in either in the curriculum or in, in the parallel areas. But um, in terms uh, of adult work, that is quite important, very important. Yeah, no, I think that that's a very powerful idea about the matriarchs and certainly the first myths of the Torah is... Yes. Cool. And so, yeah. wow. So, Yashi to you for, for everything you've done really for humanity. So, may I ask, does Robert Winston appear as one of the inventors? No, uh, definitely not. Um, I, I really keep, I mean, uh, uh, I, the only time I think any of my stuff has been mentioned in anything I've been publishing was a, a big encyclopedia of science when the editors put my name in for some, some uh, apparent achievement that they thought I'd done. I didn't really, uh, I didn't really sort of, I didn't edit it out. I just, I just sort of said, well, that, you know, we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> so, but I mean, the thing is actually with these encyclopedias, nobody reads them anyway, so. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you do for all of us, for every human being, for humankind, and for being such an incredible ambassador of the Jewish people and of Orthodox Jews generally. Uh, it, we, we feel so proud. Uh, when we see Lord Winston representing us, or well, that's how we feel, wherever you appear. And so well done. Keep up the fantastic work. Yashikov to you and Lyra for all you do for the community and for humanity. And may you only have good health till 120. Kind of you to say all that. I have to tell you, of course, that I am very fortunate because I work at Imperial College London. And one of the great things about Imperial, apart from being one of a very, very significant at science institutions has been obvious, of course, this year with its contribution to what's been going on during the pandemic, which is unparalleled within a university. Uh, I, I mean, I have to say that they support this sort of thing very actively. And also it is a very interesting campus because it's a campus where Jews can walk around completely without any risk of feeling somewhat odd or strange or uh, uh, attacked. And it's also, I think, very, very supportive of, his, of Israel, which I, which I think actually at this time is uh, really rather important. And I, I must say that um, it, it's been very good to see a huge number of non-Jewish uh, undergraduates being encouraged to go to Israel by the Israel Society, many of whom are non-Jews. And, and I wanted to say that because it's the kind of outreach, I think, which is also important amongst a different uh, group of young people, because at the moment, a lot of Jews feel uncomfortable in, in British universities. And that is, I think, very, very sad that that's happening. But, not, not at Imperial. Uh, well, may, may Imperial be a model for universities in this country and across the globe. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Lord Winston, and we'll see you soon. Good. Thank you. All the very best. He's, well, a, he's really, he's so fun and games. You know, you, ever, you know, people think, oh, science is so boring and they, they can't understand it, but he makes it really exciting. Yeah, he's, a, he's really somebody that's such an inspiration. No matter who you are, how old you are, what station in life you're at. I mean, he's just so accessible and such a lovely, fantastic fellow. Yeah, another very, we're very blessed to have him as a, a member of HESS. Yeshika, thank you, Lord Winston. So now we turn to podcasting. We had this idea for some time now to do a, an episode on podcasts. Yeah, because a lot of people are doing that now, right? And uh, again, our members out there and about go, doing taking initiatives of their own. Uh, I know you spoke with Alex Fenton. Yes, yes. Alex Fenton is a campaigner for mental health uh, initiatives. And he's now taking it to the next level with a podcast about it with some really exciting guests. 
So let's go over to Alex. Alex Fenton, welcome to Norrisley TV. Thank you. Well, it's, it's wonderful good. to have you here today. And to, today, Alex, you are here to tell us about your new podcast. So yes. What, what is a podcast? You know, fill our viewers in a little about what a podcast is and how you got into podcasting. What is a podcast? A podcast is basically a kind of snippet of information. Somebody's talking about something, something that they are passionate about. And also kind of, it is, for me, it's something that I do on a walk. So if you're going on a walk, maybe it's half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, you stick in a podcast and it's actually really nice. And it's, and the podcast industry has definitely kind of flown during lockdown. People didn't know what a podcast was, I think before, or they might've known about it, but a lot more people have become more aware of it throughout lockdown because there is a study that shows kind of that it boosts your mood and then it's kind of, yeah, you look up at the sun, you listen to a podcast and automatically your mood improves because a podcast can be ranging on any subject. I personally like to listen to kind of podcasts that are based around self-help, for example. There's some great podcasts out there that are based around self-help and also life stories. I remember talking to a friend one night and we were discussing podcasts and I was explaining to him how I felt kind of a bit socially isolated in a way. I'm very much a people's person. I love meeting people. I like talking to people. And because of lockdown, I wasn't able to do that. So I said to him, like, well, you know, I, d I don't really know where to go with it, what to do with it, etc." And he just said, why don't you launch a podcast? And I was like, nah, no, nobody. A, nobody would listen to it. B, I would have to get loads of guests on. And I just don't want to do it. Fast forward about three or four weeks later, and and kind of I started getting guests on and um, it's been such a journey and I've absolutely loved it. So I'm very blessed to know a lot of people who are kind of inspire me myself to do better and be a better person and I wanted to be able to share those snippets with other people also. Amazing, amazing. So your podcast is a self-help podcast, is that the... Mm -hmm. And, and why, why would I come to Alex Fenton's self-help podcast versus all of the other hundreds, if not thousands of self-help podcasts that are out there? Because, like I said, I've been very lucky enough to know some great people. And these great people have stories. And they're not just stories that you just listen to. I strongly feel, whilst I was recording it, I strongly felt that we're going on a journey here. This is incredible stories that will move you, that will make you inspired to, in some way, become better little snippets of kind of inspiration. For example, you know, there are a lot of people that are coming back from furlough or going back to work after COVID. And that was one of the main reasons why I decided to get Dr. Susan Kahn on, who is, uh, you know, she's a member of the show and it was just unbelievable. And if you, you know, if you are struggling with that kind of thing and then definitely, you know, listen to that podcast, it's a great one. And it just is full of snippets of incredible information that anybody would want to listen to. Wow, wonderful. Now, is this a weekly podcast that you have or more frequent or less frequent? It is, there is one that, as they say in the podcast world, it drops every Sunday night. That's what, that's the, uh, that's the term that we use. Basically, there's a podcast every Sunday night at around, so at some point on Sunday night, mainly around 7.30, I try and do it my best to get it to 7.30, um, the next podcast drops. And this week is a very special one for me personally, because it is, as the time of recording, it's Mental Health Awareness Week, or it's just started Mental Health Awareness Week. And I have Johnny Benjamin on the podcast this week, which is, and it was an, a, it was an amazing it was an amazing interview for me to do with him because it's something that I feel so passionate about. Okay, wonderful. Thank well, you. So you do get some really exciting and interesting guests on your podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Susan Khan and Johnny Benjamin. Wow. Uh, who else do we have lined up in the weeks ahead? Are you able to share that with our viewers here? So there are loads of different guests coming up. Really exciting. And one of the guests that I can kind of comes to mind for me is a guy called Anthony Shaw right, of Bedside Kosher. What they do is unbelievable. They basically feel that every single Jewish patient, where, whatever their religious beliefs are, whatever, the, whatever their religious background is, they deserve a kosher meal, a fresh kosher meal. And that is something that is just, for me, it's an incredible organization to support. So 
after listening to that episode, I really hope people reach out to Bedside Kosher, find out a bit more about them and do what they can to maybe donate a little bit of money towards it because every little helps. By you donating any money to that organization, you could provide a number of meals for people. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have just to share with you um, a uh, story that I heard just yesterday in school um, of a member of ours who's in hospital at the moment and family couldn't see uh, this person due to COVID. And Bedside Kosher came in and <clears throat> brought this fellow a meal and sat with the fella and spoon fed the fellow who wasn't able to eat on, on, on his own. And so, yeah, Yashikawa, uh, that sounds like a wonderful episode, an episode not to miss. And you know, I, I, we have a bit of a uh, Norris Lee TV uh, might have to follow on from the Alex Fenton podcast, maybe bring um, Anthony Shaw onto our uh, Norris Lee TV as well at some point. Sure, sure. It would be great. So best of luck. Is it called the Alex Fenton Show? What do we do? How do we find it? Okay, so if you go into Spotify and you type inside the pod podcast, that's what it's called because I had this vision of if you go outside at kind of during lockdown or if you wouldn't have been able to go outside, kind of you couldn't go to public places during lockdown. So a lot of people got these really weird pods that could come into your garden. And it's the idea of sitting down with someone inside this virtual pod and getting to know them a little bit more, having those conversations. So if you follow on Spotify, in Sky, inside underscore the pod podcast, you would be able to find us. And also at the same time, if you have Instagram, you can find us on inside underscore the pod podcast on Instagram. Wow, excellent, fabulous. Wow, that's really amazing that you scored that name uh, for anyone else. Well done, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Mazel Tov on your new podcast. Wish you, wish you much Hatzlacha, much success. Thank and, you. And only blessings and simcha in your life and in the lives of all the people that you are inspiring with your fabulous new podcast. Well done, Alex. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on RSD TV. Cheers. Thank you, Rabbi. Wow, what a brave young man. Really. Yes, yes, you yes. Know, and he just graduated Mazel Tov with, with a master's in mental health. That's fa fabulous. And now he's going to devote his entire life to, to helping people. And he's really such a wonderful, wonderful young man who, you know, loves right. being with people. He does. He really brightens up the room when he walks in. That's so cool. you, you, met, you met with Shelly Ann Salisbury. Yes, Shelly Ann. She is uh, amazing. She's, she's got her hands in, in many different things um, in the community. And I think actually she had an important event yesterday for Nisan Hashem, oh, where yes. she you know, put a lot on the table, coordinating, talking about issues in Israel and Gaza. Muslim and Jewish women um, standing right here at Wildwood yesterday, um, you know, really recognizing that the situation is complicated and needs to be addressed. So to Shellyanne. But Shellyanne, actually, um, her podcast is very, it's something very unique. It uh, talks about mediation. So let's go over to Shellyanne and hear about her podcast. Right. Welcome, Shellyanne, to Norrisley TV. Hey, I'm very excited to be here, Batya. It's lovely for you to invite me on. Absolutely. So Shellyanne, uh, just for our viewers, is a uh, very proud member of HESS Shoal community and um, very involved in many different things. Um, you rep you, I know you're involved in the interfaith work, uh, specifically with Nisan Nashim, women yeah. and uh, Jewish and, and Muslim women coming together, doing different programming, as well as you're an editor on the local suburb news. Correct, yes. Amazing. <laughs> uh, but professionally, you are a lawyer, correct? Well, professionally, I'm a I'm a mediator. Yeah, I right. was a lawyer. <laughs> was a, right, many yeah. many years. You might say that once a lawyer, always a lawyer. But I um, actually am an accredited mediator, and that's what I'm that's what I'm currently doing. Wow. Okay. Wonderful. The reason I asked you to join us today because I noticed that you you um, started a new initiative doing podcasts mm -hmm. um, and and on mediation on conflict resolution in particular. I was, I, was, I was interested as to how you got involved in this. I guess maybe just tell us a little bit about your background, how you, how you got involved in mediation, and then we'll go to the podcast. 
Okay, all right. So as a lawyer, and many uh, lawyers who may, may be watching this will appreciate, lawyers are always involved in some kind of dispute, uh, conflict dispute with their, with their clients. I was a non litigious lawyer, meaning I was dealing with contracts, um, joint ventures, takeovers, that, that type of thing. So more in the corporate and commercial areas, um, so non litigious, but even still, during negotiations, there would always be uh, disputes that would come up. And if you didn't iron out those disputes, then you didn't get to sign that contract. So it was very important that uh, the parties involved went ahead and signed on the dotted line with everything resolved as far as possible. So if I saw a conflict, I would, I would uh, head it off straight away and we would talk about it and try to resolve it. So throughout my fairly long legal career as a commercial lawyer, I was mediating without even calling myself a mediator. That's what I was doing. And many lawyers, it, this will resonate with many lawyers. So um, after that, um, I've had a number of, I have what's called a portfolio career, I guess. Um, I went into a number of different things, but one of the areas I went to um, went into was, um, was a sort of a startup. Um, and I was involved in that for quite a while. And during that time, I, uh, we, we, we actually had a problem with the distributor and uh, we were um, presented with it with a, with a writ and it was a, um, an American company. And then we ended up in, in quite a difficult uh, um, conflict with this um, ex-distributor uh, who was based in America. We probably lasted for about four years in this quite oh, embittered wow. uh, court case. Um, so it never went to court, but we had to have all the preliminary stuff. And what I found was that um, one, of, one of the things we had to do was go for mediation. So I had to go out to Florida and I had to attend a mediation. I knew nothing about mediation as a, as a party to a mediation. I knew what it was. Um, I knew clients of mine who had been involved in mediation, but as a, as a, as a party involved in the medi mediation, this was a first. And it was really quite an eye-opener. It wasn't a particularly good mediation. It didn't end in resolution, unfortunately. So it went on for a while longer. But at the back of my mind, I always thought, you know what, I'm, I'm very um, interested in this whole subject. People become embattled. They need to move on. And I could see that everyone was stuck. People get very stuck very, very quickly and they become entrenched in their positions. Absolutely. And the more they try to get out, the more they seem to get stuck. And it needs somebody to come along, someone like me, a mediator, who can help them. And so it's interesting because even though you were you were acting as a lawyer, as a solicitor before, you know, and, and as you said, doing mediation, this was all this was an, an eye-opener for you because you were actually in the, in the role of mediation? Exactly, I, I, was, I was one of the parties subject to mediation. And I thought to myself, I think I could do a better job of this mediation. I was almost having sort of one of those out of body experiences throughout the whole mediation, thinking, shouldn't we be saying this? And maybe if we did that and just bringing together my experience from quasi mediation from my legal uh, career in the past. And I, anyway, it was the point was at the back of my head, I had this idea that um, if ever I changed careers at some point, mediation would be something I would, I would probably look, look to, which is what happened. Um, I'm always very interested in why people become um, embattled, wh what causes the issues um, and the psychology behind it. Mm. So um, sort of zooming quite a way forward and after other sort of career changes, um, I decided that I would I would um, go ahead and train as a mediator, which I which I which I did, and it is completely and utterly fascinating. Honestly, it really is. Um, it's also very fulfilling because you get to help people. Right. And one thing I just want to clarify: a mediator is not a therapist. I, I've had um, potential uh, clients come to me and say, "Oh, well." I'm, I'm, if I'm going to go ahead with this mediation, shall I just stop all my therapy? It's like, no, do not <laughs> stop the therapy. Right. No, 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 no. This is not what we do. A mediator is basically somebody who is neutral, who gives a safe space to two parties who are stuck and allows them to tell their story in their own way. It gives them agency and they come to the resolution themselves with the guidance 
of, of a mediator facilitating it. It's a very specialist technique. It's a, it's a great toolkit to have, but it must be used carefully. The beauty of it, I have to say, is that if you go to court, it is, you have a winner and a loser. That's it. You have, right. it, 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 nobody, nobody comes out of court feeling fantastic apart from the winner, but then they've spent probably goodness knows how much, you know, usually. Um, it's also a space where you are caught up in a very uh, arid system, legal terminology, and you do not put your case in the way that you'd like it. It goes through the funnel of the court system and the lawyers. It's, it's just not, it's just not giving you a, a, a platform, not, not really. Yeah. This way, you've got a much quicker system. It's not, I wouldn't even call it a system, it's a process. It's, a, it's an open table. You have, as I say, a safe space. You say what you need to say. You say it the way you want to say it. And you work towards some form of resolution. Doesn't always work. Many times it won't work on the day of the mediation, but amazingly, it will work later. It almost causes the parties to have a shift in their thinking. You, you know, you, you cause them to have another way of thinking about something. And afterwards it plays out and it, it can actually just trigger the, the resolution later. Right. So it's very effective if, it is, if it's used properly. I am offering them a, 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 a control situation. They can sit down together. We have what we call private sessions and uh, public sessions where open sessions where they can come together right. or, or I put them in breakout rooms. Obviously, obviously everything's online these days. Mm. So we're doing it all via Zoom. So they're in breakout rooms. I speak to both of them. I don't bring them together until I feel they're ready to be able to have that conversation. I'm watching them so carefully. I'm watching for signs. I'm watching for, cue, for, for cues and tells and any uncomfortableness. I'm trying to work out what the real problem is because you know, somebody can come with an issue. It's a neighbor dispute. It's a workplace issue. It's a pet dispute. It's a shareholding dispute, whatever it is. It's never, and I'm honestly, I would say 99%, it's never really about that is the underlying uh, problems that has, you know, where they have felt unheard, unlistened to, undermined. Somebody said something once and they can't quite kind of process it. And it's always, usually they want an apology. That's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. So yeah. it's much more than just the basic facts, which is what a court would deal with. I'm dealing with the human emotion side of, of the dispute. Right, right. Well, right, yeah, and, and probably the first step is is just to come to the table, right? I mean- That is a huge step though, Betty. You it, say it like, uh, you know, this is to get them to the table, the, you're 50% you're of the way there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's yeah. great. So you know that when people want to come to the table, you have something to work with. When, it, when they don't, it's another whole- I <laughs> do not accept anybody at right. mediation until they have told me they're 100% committed to this because it doesn't work otherwise. Right. It has to be all parties, all aboard. Right. It sounds it sounds awesome work. Yes, yeah, And so, how did you move to the podcast? What, okay. How did that happen? So, one of the ways I explain various um, elements of uh, mediation, such as, for example, take the power of apology, which I am telling you is huge. Um, to, to explain it, I write a lot of blogs and articles using the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. I write a lot anyway. Um, and I, yeah, well, as an editor, yes, but also I'm, a, I'm I write a column for the Ham and High, I write for other journals, and I do my own. Uh, I, I'm a creative writer as well, so I love storytelling. It sort of goes through my my family, and um, we are we are a big storytelling family. So I use storytelling. So I I I, I have a, a story that I that I um, illust to illustrate a point, and they're short, but they resonate with the readership hopefully. So mm. one of the ways, so it's just a medium that, I, that I'm using to demystify mediation and make it less scary. And let's just talk about what it really means. Another fantastic um, uh, medium um, and an accessible medium is podcasting. Now, I, I came to podcasting maybe four years ago when I just used to listen to a few things like, do you remember something called Serial? I don't know if you know, know what I'm talking about, but it was a, it was a crime type sort of um, uh, a, 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 like a true life crime thing, which was fascinating when everyone was hooked. In fact, when I used to walk on the Heath with a dog, everyone was plugged in 
at this point because we're all going what episode are you on okay I'm not going to tell you anything so this this cause podcast I think to become much more mainstream there are some fantastic um programs out there and, and and since then people have used podcasts in so many inventive ways and I had this idea that I love talking to people I'm a great um I'm a great sort of believer in communication if you mm. talk to somebody I was gonna say face to face and we're not even face to face properly but you know what I mean if you have an issue and you can sit down with a cup of coffee or tea and a chocolate biscuit because that's the important part you can sit down you, it's amazing how much you can sort out and I've always felt that when there is a problem sit down with somebody and talk so through a, a podcast you're actually having a conversation and what I thought is how about I interview some some mediators from different parts of um Oh, as you say, of the industry. So I've been interviewing mediators who deal with high trauma, who deal with um, prison offenders, who deal with hostage as negotiation oh, wow. situations, who are dealing with co-parenting, which is incredibly hard, actually very, very hard. Mm -hmm. I also been speaking to mediators who deal with um, boundary disputes, any, any sort of dispute, but I'm learning about them as people. And I'm trying to show the listeners these are human beings. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to say, look, we're all human beings here. Some of us have skills. We are expert in helping you over a problem. The problem is you're stuck. Let's, let's explain how we, can, how we can help here. And we use real examples of their case studies, obviously all confidential, to illustrate. So again, that's a storytelling side. Um, here was a situation, here's what I did, and here was the outcome. And it seems to have filtered down. Um, and I've had quite a few people come back who say, I didn't even realize what mediation did. I didn't even know how effective it was. In fact, this is just an aside. This is quite a story. It's a little one. Somebody said to me a few weeks ago, could I Zoom the next day? And I said, no, I'm busy all day long. And they said, what do you mean all day? I said, yeah, I'm out between nine and five. And they said, well, you know, what are you doing? So I said, I'm, a, I'm actually um, observing a mediation. Sometimes you observe mediations for other mediators and you take notes and you feedback, which is what I was doing. So you're really in uh, a mediation, you're completely uh, involved, you, you, you can't break off. So they said to me, wow, that sounds so boring. And I said, no, it's great, so interesting. I, I, you know, why are you saying that? And they said, how long again? I said, you know, between about nine and five and it could go on longer, so I can't do it. And they said, you know, shelly Ann, I didn't realize you were such a patient person. I said, well, I'm not sure I'm that patient, but you know, when needs must, you've just got to, you know, you've got to do, you've got to do it. I said, I said, I said hold on a second. What do you think, you, I, I said I was observing and they said, well, you, you said you were observing a meditation. I said, no, I'm not observing a meditation. So again, that's another example of people just mix up mediation, meditation. Mm. It's got a kind of strange medical sound to it, medication. And I'm just trying to explain, this is a fantastic way of helping people to move on in all areas where they are in limbo because they can't resolve something. And that's what mediation does. Wow. Well, amazing. Yashika, I mean, really, like you say, you know, it's, it's, it's important to get to just to talk, right, to talk it through, to yeah. really, you know, a lot of the issues, you know, um, are not even the real issues that, at, you know, that they bring forward. There's a lot of underlying things, like you say, just an apology, just to talk it through. Um, and, and so it's amazing that you're, you're doing this to get people to come to the table and to really get to the bottom of it. And I'm sure there's, like you said, there's a lot of probably a lot of psychology and therapy in there. Yes. But, um, but we're not therapists. No, again. not therapists. You know, it's probably very <laughs> yeah. therapeutic at the same yeah. time. Oh, hugely. It's hugely. Yeah. Amazing, which is what people need. It's interesting. Like you say, we're humans all, we're, we're, we're at, we have the power to change, to make a difference, to, to make that um, whatever dispute there is to come to a resolution. We absolutely do. And I think I would even go uh, slightly further to say that, yes, we're humans and we have that power, but we have the, if we could just listen and listen and put ourselves in other people's shoes, yeah, it's amazing how that, how that shifts perception. We you know we're so, as I said, I think I used the word earlier entrenched. This is all we see. And the longer it goes on, the more we are in our little corner and we need to just say, hold on a second. Let me, let me think how that person might be feeling. And that's what I do as a mediator. I just say, how do you think? 
they are feeling. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So you're opening up the whole um, field of vision where it was completely closed off before. And that does make a difference. They can start to appreciate. They're not necessarily going to agree straight away because it's a long process sometimes, Absolutely. but they can start to think, you know what? There are two sides to this and I need to listen. So listening is so important. Absolutely, for sure. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And where can we find the podcast for, for those who- The podcast is on um, all uh, podcast um, forums. So you've got Apple, Google, um, Spotify. Spotify, and it's also on my website, which is themediationpod.net. Okay, wonderful. Well, Yasha Koch, and uh, thank you Thanks, very Katya. much for joining us. And thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Shelly You know, that's a lot of food for thought. You know, how many of us just fail to realize that you just need to come to the table? Well, yeah, it's absolutely, you know, I was talking to her afterwards uh, uh, offline and I said, you know, how do you get, because, you know, we know that the first step, as you mentioned, is to come to the table. How do you get people to come to the table when they're not willing to? And she said, you know, a lot of times they, they know coming to the table, they know they're, 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 everything's going to come out in the open. But she does amazing work that, you know, people who are willing to work with the issue, work with the matter that, that at hand, able to come to the table, it's really something special. So Yashikar, uh, Shelly-Ann. Now, of course, our weekly Anglo-Jewish canon. Yes. <laughs> this week we're joined by Michael Wigia, who was the former head of UJIA, and a bit of a different uh, book or approach this week, but stimulating. Very, very stimulating. And uh, I just want to shout out to Martin Kay. You know, he's really uh, the brainchild behind this, uh, you know, getting getting these videos from different p individuals to promote, to, to suggest, to recommend different books. So let's go over to Michael to see what he suggests. Hello, I'm Michael Wieger, currently the Interim Chief Executive of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. I've been an occasional visitor in recent years to Norris Lee, where I've been asked by Martin Kay to speak at your coffee and chat sessions on a Shabbat morning. I'm also very honoured to have been asked by Martin and the Shul to say a few words about a particular book of Jewish interest that I would recommend to members of the Shul to read. The one I have gone for is Aaron Lansky's Outwitting History. It's a remarkable story of Aaron's life, whereby him and a bunch of friends went round the United States searching for Yiddish books that elderly people knew their children and grandchildren wouldn't read and risked being lost, thrown away and turned into trash. And so they set up this project whereby they would go and visit elderly people throughout the United States. One person would chat, one person would eat and one person would go through the books and carry them all away. It is a very funny but also a really moving account of a lost world and the attempt being made now by Lansky and his group to preserve those books so that scholarship can be maintained and also scholars both old and new can learn and appreciate the remarkable contribution of Yiddish to Jewish culture and Jewish civilization uh, for now and for always. They've even built a centre, the National Yiddish Book Centre in Amherst which I've never been to, but I understand is an extraordinary place. Parts of the book really made me quite emotional, as one hears of the disputes between Yiddishists, who were socialists and some who were religious and some who were secular, battling away in New York, those same battles that had taken place in Eastern Europe decades before. And of course, when we think of contemporary arguments in the Jewish world, left, right, secular, religious, etc. Sometimes we think we're living in a very argumentative era. In fact, arguments are core and intrinsic to the Jewish tradition. And this book displays and tells that story in a very moving, very educative and a fascinating way. And I highly recommend it. Thank you. You know, listening to Michael just now, made me think maybe, you know, I know that there is international Jewish or Yiddish celebration day coming up. Absolutely. You know, uh, we were able 
so this is a really amazing book. I didn't know about um, this outwitting history with Aaron Lansky and um, really, really fascinating stuff. I mean, this what this guy did was, you know, really save Yiddish. You know, I growing up, uh, you know, in a Hasidish environment where Yiddish was always around me, uh, you know, we touched, we, we, we translated Chumash by Yomer and Erad Gazakt, you know, and I don't think they do that now even. I don't know, we should check that out. But because a lot of people didn't really understand it. But at the time, I didn't really appreciate it, although I did really well in Yiddish. Um, <laughs> it's I, your Litfish background. It's my Litfish background. I realized that there was more to it. So um, it's beginning to embrace it again. And uh, we're going to devote, actually, look out, watch the space, because we have a very special Yiddish episode coming up. I might have to start calling you Robinson again. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, talking about Robinson, actually, I was passing by uh, our, it was our neighbors behind the bowling um, club, and uh, he actually called me Robinson, so that's why it was interesting. Uh, and I, I took, we went over to take a look at who was bowling there as I was passing by playing some tennis with Joey, grabbed her phone and caught some footage. They almost sold her a membership. <laughs> they did. Well, they're actually trying to get you on. <laughs> But let's go over to see. That's only because I look older than her. <laughs> they actually have a young guy. Uh, they recruited one of the younger uh, members there. So let's go over to see. He's just a mascot. <laughs> to see the what the bowling club has to offer. We have Bishop's Woods Bowling Club right behind the shoal. And we're here now with Michael, the captain of the club. So, Michael, you have quite a crowd out here this, <laughs> this afternoon. Is, this morning we had, Some of our members. Hello. This morning we had three hello. times the amount. Really? Every yeah. rink was full up. Amazing. I okay. use this publicity for the club. Yeah. Yes, would you like oh, to... So we, need, we need some more. Come in, members. Emmanuel, by all means. <laughs> would you like to say a few words? Um. Okay, so, Michael, tell us a little bit about the club. How long has it been here and... What's well, the... actually, this has been here oh, no, since the 19, 1930s. <laughs> 1930s? Yes, wow. it's been here a long, long time. Uh, I think Sol is a founder member. No, he's not. <laughs> it's his birthday I, this weekend. Yeah, I know. A very I special know. birthday. We're going to go catch him a little later. And in actual fact, we, we uh, the club actually send all the members a uh, birthday card on their birthdays. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. We, obviously, we have their birthday uh, dates uh, when they sign the, the form. When they register. Yeah. So we know uh, exactly when their birthday dates are. And we, wow. we send a birthday card. It's, actually, it's a very, very friendly club. Extremely yeah. friendly club. Do you have women who play? Of course. Okay, great. Course. Not, you open, you in open fact, we had about six women here this morning. Oh, that's excellent. And I see a young chap back there. Is you, You're trying to attract the younger generation we as well, few. right? We have a few. That's, uh, his name is Bradley. He's 40 years old, actually. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah. And so, so how, what do you have to do to join the club? Just come along and see me. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So, and, uh, that, uh, where is he? Uh, coming towards us now, he's the head coach. His name is George. George. George, you can say a few words for the show. For the show, the Norris Lee TV, yeah, the for the show TV. Which show? Norris Lee, right, right in front of you, oh, right that show, right there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? When, you're backing. You're I, backing right I, behind it. We're giving you permission a, I, I to play. Me, I've been member there for forty-five years. Forty-five years. Yeah. Look at that. And where are you now? I'm in a good shoe now. At, at Bowler's Green, no. Bishop's. <laughs> no, no, no. Kinloss. Kinloss. Oh, okay. You moved across the road. They're our sister. That's all right. So you have a message for the rabbi? Yeah, Rabbi Friedman. Come and play bowls like Rabbi Jackson used to. Oh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> there you are. You see, so no, I didn't know that. You didn't know that. Oh, the rabbis can play bowls. You see bowls. that man there? Yeah, he looks like he wants to tell us something. No, I'm going to tell you something about him. Many years ago, he was so religious, he used to stand in his kittle. The whole of Yom Kippur never sat down. The whole day he used to stand. Is wow. that a fact? It's a fact. And look what's happened to him now. It's a fact. No, and that's why he's a good bowler. He is the best layman I've ever heard. <laughs> so what do you have to share? What's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Well, I was going to say that um, I went to Norris Lee from sort of the early 1940s. And I used to pass here and see all these very, very old men in their white jumpers and their grey trousers and I thought 1940 I was I'm only four years old in 1940 well, yeah, so was I, I wasn't born then. <laughs> so was I 
Excellent. It was very, very I was strange. Still in South Africa, Africa then. Never thought that. You know, <laughs> I must tell you something. So you, you but you're missing the gray, the the gray pants and the white blazer. Um, no, I'm delighted. It's become less formal. Okay. No, no. no, no. I was During the week, we we are informal. I'll tell you. Alan's about to shoot. There we go. Wow, look at that. And now we have Solly. We have a lot of patience for this game. And focus. Ooh, he knocked it out. I didn't even know what that means. So cool. He pushed it away from the other ball. So, Alan, how long have you been playing bowl? Bowl. Oh, I've been playing for about seven or eight years. Wow. But I got, I mean, as gradually as I gave up tennis for a certain amount, I started playing bowls. So you still got the good arm. I can still manage it just about. That's amazing. <laughs> anyway. And when did you get Solly? Solly, when did you join the the game? Well, play what? How when did, how long you've been playing? Oh, about ten years. Ten years already. Can't get any better. Wow, wow. So this is your birthday weekend, huh? May, May the thirteenth. May the thirteenth. Not bad for ninety-five, eh? Amazing, amazing. We wish you a happy birthday and Yashikov. We got some good balls. You you knocked Alan's ball right, <laughs> right out of the shot there. Great Love job. You Take care. You know, it's amazing. Alan Cohen and Solly really, you know. But it's it's it's, a, it's an interesting sport, sport, you know. And yeshakov to them for continuing on and and playing. And you know, they we know they're here on a on a daily, if not weekly, basis. Uh, uh, Bernard weekly. Taub is also a big bowler. Oh, I didn't catch him. I have to go back. <laughs> Quite a few. So uh, you know, Rabbi, they're waiting for you to join. So I, t I did tell him you're gonna go and and say hello. So. Um, Go out and check it out. I'm sure they would love to see more of HSS members uh, playing uh, there. That's some exciting programs coming up. So I have to tell you, we have for the first time on a weeknight back to in-person shiurim. Yes, on Shabbos. You did your Shabbos morning. You, you, you moved your Sunday to Shabbos morning. You... That's right. That's already back in person, Shabbos morning, with a bit of coffee. Although people are trying to figure out how to drink the coffee through the face mask. Um, I'm... There's a little open flap. <laughs> <laughs> but this coming Thursday, we have Rabbi Alex Chapa from Boring Wood Street oh, Synagogue, oh, yes. who is joining us for the Rabbinic Chavrusa, the monthly discussion of Rabbi Lord Sachs of Blessed Memories books. So we are doing it in person at Norris Lee. Please do join us on Thursday evening at eight o'clock. Registrations are necessary. Uh, of course, we will still live stream and we realize that not everybody's quite ready to come back, but but if you would consider it, this is, this is, we need to get back in learning in person and it'll give you the opportunity to ask questions in person. Please do consider joining us on Thursday evening. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting talking about live. We had Dovey live at the Bat Mitzvah for the first time in Shul playing. So that He's a was, real person. He is a real person and he plays even better live. So uh, it's really wonderful to see things are coming back in person and um, see it for yourself. So for those of you who are able to be back, we really welcome you back. And um, and of course, we have the also the uh, availability online for those who, who, who are not yet able to. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Next week is half term. We will see you all in a fortnight time. Shalom. Lehitra Art. <laughs>